Hi, this is Mike Baker. This is the second in a series I'm doing called God's World Purpose. This is well, for more or less or any other reasons. It's just called the Gospel of the Land. Get your Bible. Let's work together. Father, we ask you to bless us today as we come together. Open our minds, Lord Jesus. Open our minds, Holy Spirit, sir. Father, we ask you to, to show us by your Spirit, your Word. Very simple. Not going to be a, a long, deep study, but a, a large... No, just take a big brush and paint it big. Most of us think about a personal salvation, but over and over again through your Word, I, I have seen, since I was studious about it, being a Christian, wanted to know where we're going and where we came from, what we're supposed to do. Most of it was in the Word in that way, if you read it, all of it from beginning to end. There are those that I have known over the years that, that are fascinated with the Old Testament are stuck in it. Some that are fascinated with the New Testament they are stuck in that, which is okay. We have a a big God, a progressive revelation that he gave us through the Word, all the way to the book of Revelation, all the way to the the Gospels. The epistles, which are wonderful letters. I thank God for people messing up. So Paul would write letters to them, and I'd have them for later, and we'd have them in our personal life. But we're going to look at the gospel of the land today, the second one of our series. The first one was the, garden, the gospel of the garden, what Adam preached to his people. Now we're going into the gospel of the land. We have this series... And I think it will help you. It helped me. Let's let's work from this diagram. Three circles on a piece of paper. And the first circle had the center of it, Adam, and river flowing out of the river. Four rivers flowing out of that circle. Uh, Eden, the garden. And we move to the second circle in the center of that is Moses and Israel in that one. And again, the principle of the exportation of the life of Israel, which we're going to develop in a minute, flowing out of those four rivers, as it was supposed to. Four is the number of the world, as we stated in the last study. There's something we need to state, which is a cliche in my life, what I've always believed and repeated a lot. God is a world person. He's not a uh, personal person. He is, but our tendency is to raise God is to make him something less than what he revealed himself to be. And that's not our fault, but but we needed to see the bigger part. Israel did it. They wanted to own God and exclude everybody else. So in some degree, the church has done it too. And it's their God. They have all kinds of different organizations, Baptists and Presbyterians and Pentecostals. It's their God. No, it's the world's God. He loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son. Now, after the fall, it became a point in time that during the intermediate period when God called a man called Abram and he called him to leave his kindred and leave his land and start out for a country that he would show him yeah and so Abram started out with obedience to God to make his trek to a country that God was going to show him which country of was going to belong to him and his seed for the purpose. Now the purpose was to bless the whole world, the whole earth. Now God put Adam in the garden not just for Adam to be an end to himself in the garden but not for the garden's sake itself too an end of that deal. But the garden which was in the land of Eden was to be the center point from which which would go out uh, the whole culture and message of God which we have called it in the last talk, the gospel of the garden. It will go out to cover the whole earth, the whole world, by those four rivers, and that's how we started. Now Abraham's car, he's called to build a land, 13th chapter of Genesis. The land is geographically described to, to Abraham. It's a land designed for him and for his seed. Now remember when God called Abraham, through Abraham and his seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. 
Now, here's a God who's a world person. Through Abram and his seed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Now, Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and God became known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the gifts of the Spirit that I started working in 40 years ago in a church. We were worshiping God, and some woman spoke in tongues in the front, and the place became hushed. The Spirit of God was moving. And the interpretation came to me, and I heard inside me, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know me well. I had only been saved for maybe a month or two, and I didn't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at all. So instead of speaking it out, I wrote it down. Yep, I wrote it down. There were five pastors. It was a regional conference and hundreds of people. And they were waiting for that interpretation, which never came. It just never came. It was mine. I was supposed to give it, and I did, written. And I went up after the service, and I handed the pastor, my pastor, this interpretation. which I wrote it all down. It came to me, and it was about two pages. And he stopped and looked at me, and he didn't, he didn't rebuke me. He just looked at me carefully and smiled because he knew I was a new convert and come to his church. And he got saved in my living room. I didn't get saved in church, but that the church we felt that we were supposed to go to, and we looked at a few of them. And he said, the next time that comes, don't be afraid to stand up and just start talking. you got the interpretation to the tongues. These are the gifts of the Spirit. And he was an old cowboy. And he said, this is this is how you do it. And he told me how to do it. And it, okay, I begged God in prayer, don't, don't stop. I want to know the gifts of the Spirit. I want to know what's mine in the Word. As much as I can get, it was a personal thing. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He became known as that, the covenant God. He's the great ty triune source of the, the redeemed communities, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we need to grow up in this land. They developed a, a culture that was proper for God, which in turn which was to be exported to the entire earth again. This has been God's intention from the very beginning, from the Garden of Eden. Now, the land that Abram is going to is is going to become the the new Garden of Eden. And Abram begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob had twelve sons. Now, the twelve sons became the became the nation, a nation became a nation called Israel in Israel, who God made covenant with. Now, in the course of time, there was a famine, and this nation found it necessary to to leave there and go to, go to Egypt, because the famine was in the land, pretty rough, and had rough condition. They lived in the land of Egypt for, Egypt for many years, and multiplied and became a, a numerous people, big people, and eventually the Egyptians decided we better subjugate these people and put them under our control. If we don't, they'll probably take over our country. So they did try to subjugate them, and they succeeded in it. They um, made them literally a nation of slaves within that country. Then God called Moses to go down and deliver the people out of Egypt. Now, the burning bush incident, and it becomes a great type of redemption and salvation for for the Jews, and with a view to let all the nations be blessed, and let let all the nations know what God's purposes are. And God delivered the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, because Israel was Jacob's new name after he wrestled with the angel. His prodigy, the nation was issued from his loins, from his sons, become the nation and the children of Israel. That's where it came from. The children of Israel were were delivered the hands of the Egyptians out of hands of slave masters through a wilderness and into the land. And I want to look at those three words for just a moment. And we got our little diagram with three lines. 
and on each line we write a word. Egypt, the wilderness, and the land. It's simple, but it's, just, it's a good diagram for me. Under each of the words are these prepositions, out of, for Egypt, through, for the wilderness, and into, for the land. Those are the three tenses that of redemption. Out of, Egypt, through, and into the land. They had to be delivered out of Egypt. We want to take time to go through that. We did that before already. But we need to say there needs to be shedding of blood. There had to be the the legal care for the guilt factor that was there too. He had to cover it and redeem them by, by blood, every one of them. He had to get them out of that condition of slavery. And so the demonstration of his power. So by blood and by power, Israel was delivered out of Egypt. Blood and power. Now they're on their way to the land. On their way to the piece of property in the center of the earth that God has promised to Abraham and his seed. That's where they're headed. And the wilderness is a, it's a place of, of of maturation and instruction to start getting your act together. They've been delivered out of the land of Egypt where they're slaves. About three million of them out in the wilderness. Imagine that. And they're a nation completely under the care of God. Look at it. They're under the care of God. God has a nation in his hands. whole nation. You have to learn the ways of God. You have to depend on God. You have to believe him. You have to believe him for if food. If believe he, he provides him with manna, with water out of the rock. God provides him with his material needs, clothes and shoes and so forth, so on, so on. He provides him with instruction on in how they shall function as a, a nation, a people, a people of God. And at Mount Sinai, he delivers a constitution to Moses for a nation. Now, it's very unique. There was n no nation. This is the only nation, God-given constitution that was given to any nation. The only one at Mount Sinai. God delivered at Mount Sinai to Moses and through Moses uh, to the nation of Israel a constitution that covered every aspect of life. Every aspect of human life. So here's a very unique nation. A nation that is completely dependent upon the Lord, upon God, completely responsible to the Lord, and provided a divine constitution. They were provided a divine constitution which would enable them to live as a nation under divine instruction and inspiration. A most remarkable a nation. Uh, wow, there's nothing to say about this. That they went through the wilderness, they were being prepared to go into into their permanent vocation of taking up residence in in the land. Read it and look at it. The wilderness experience was of miracles and signs and wonders and miraculous food, discipline too, miraculous water, military protection. Just a lot of miracles happened there. They were cured like children. Yeah, they were cared for, but the instruction came. They cared for like babies. But when they came to Mount Sinai, they were told how the must function as a nation. And they said, yeah, it starts. And the little phrase keeps coming up over and over again, when you come into the land, when you come into the land. And you look at it and see it. And that generation that should have went into the land did not go into the land. There's a story to itself right there. But that second generation was ready to go in. Moses gave us in the book of Deuteronomy the second reading of the law. And he kept referring to this little phrase, when you come into the land, when you come into the land. Now, I see the land as a place of maturity. That's what I see it as. When a person gets saved, and we went over this, when a person gets saved in our evangelical situation, we talk about getting saved to go to heaven. Uh, yeah, there's merit in that. 
course. It's right, but in the New Testament, you don't see the goal of heaven is, is held primarily before the eyes of Christian people, period. The writer of the Hebrews said, let's go on to perfection, not heaven. Let's go on to maturity. Well, not heaven. Heaven's automatic. Uh, I got that right away. Eternity with God is automatic. That's part of the salvation package through the Lord Jesus. But the part that's neglected, and I think has been neglected, which I've seen for 40 years, is to be matured here in, in history for the reason for property representing God before the nations. There are far too many Christians who are interested in getting saved and getting off to heaven. Just get out of here. This place is bad. I don't want to be here. They have a bad attitude towards the world. They give up on the world. Now, God didn't give up on the world. Believe me. Through the years, God has commissioned me to go out into the world, get people saved, bring them into the kingdom, and raise them up. That they do the same thing. He never did stop that commission with me. He never did tell me, well, you're going to heaven pretty soon, blah, 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 blah. No, he did not. Go here, go here, do this, do that. Go, 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 go. I couldn't get people into church to get them born again. So I had to go to them and had to pick out a, let the Lord choose a vocation for me that I could do that. I always liked engineering. Uh, I like math. I, I, I like to draw and design, which I, I have for years, and I enjoy it. And so I went into mechanical contracting statewide, which would get me everywhere. I had to go to school for it, of course, get my licenses, and enter into my mm, job. <laughs> job. When I got commissioned by the Lord, he told me, go to work for me. He didn't say, you'll be in heaven soon. He said, go to work for me. And I wondered about that and pondered on it for a long time. Go to work for me, go to work for me. Is that the commission as a, a disciple of the Lord? Yeah, in ways, but he spoke plain English to me. Go to work for me. He didn't say, thou, thee, thou, thou, thou. <laughs> no. Go to work for me. And it's never stopped. In 40 years that I've served him, it hasn't stopped. He has never said, can't wait. I had a vision of heaven when I was first a Christian. And I wondered why. But a lot of people didn't get visions, but I had a vision. And I wasn't super spiritual. I never have been. I've been called that, but I'm not. I'm truthful. If it's true, well, let's do it. If it's not true, well, don't waste your time. I had a vision of heaven. Oh, it was pretty. Gosh, it was pretty. Beyond words. And I saw people flying around in it. Saw angels flying around in it. Flying. <laughs> they were flying. They weren't just walking. And I asked the Lord for years, what did that mean? He never told me. There was no words that came with that. And I kept asking him, kept after me. About five years in, one afternoon, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart inside. He said, do you remember that vision of heaven I showed you? I said, yes, sir. I was going to show you that, the end from the beginning. Because at times, especially in the end of your life, it's going to be very hard and to feel like quitting. Feel like giving up. This is the reward, one of them. Heaven, picture of it. So, yes, that's automatic. That's there. I'm not going to give up on that. I won't quit. And that's for people. That's for people. I also saw darkness and hell put in that for a while. And that was the earth. And I just was terrified. Cried for days when I saw that. And I'm not a crier. But I didn't want people to go there. You must be born again and regenerated of the Holy Spirit into your spirit. And then start walking the walk. And that's where we're learning this. And I've taken years to learn this. You're supposed to make disciples of the nations. That's what I was supposed to do. And a lot of evangelical teaching, they use that scripture, but they don't put much content to it. And I have for years watched this. But the general idea is get saved and get to heaven as quick as you can. But the emphasis in the New Testament is get saved and, and get matured and become a useful citizen for the kingdom of God and spread his gospel and influence throughout the world. That you happens in many ways, not just words only, but power too. And what God had wanted in the Garden of Eden, he brought it over to the New Covenant, the second phase which we're talking about now is, is the gospel of the land. The land. 
the, the land as he brought this whole nation to the wilderness to mature them out there to start preparing them he's ex he prepared them experientially he was testing them he would see if they would follow his word he showed himself strong on their behalf he also corrected them hard but that Sinai gave them the Constitution do this do this this is this is what you do for a, a well-rounded life that they're supposed to live the Word of God says it has been given to you the Word of God is life to you it gives you life all things have been given to me that pertain to life and godliness that was what I'm the Constitution was given to the body right there now I uh, you research this more and more in preparation of this and, and teachings like it I found a lot of scholars and a lot of and I, I have a lot of books and I enjoy reading I did a lot and I do a lot of audio reading now and they pretty much say this too and these would be scholars I do one of them said the grand object called the covenant with Abraham was to render the world truly blessed in its inhabitants himself forming the immediate starting point of the design which was which was thereafter to, to grow and to germinate to the whole circle of humanity were embraced and engulfed in, in his magnificent provisions and unions wonderful thing an occupation of promised inheritance by a portion of the heirs of blessing well it was to image and to prepare for an image of the whole by the entire company of the blessed in, in particular and the particular must here been for the sake of the general the universal the ultimate all of it so God's intention from one man Abraham through him God's intention in calling one man Abraham was that all the family of the earth would be blessed it says it right there let's let's go back there and link it with the Garden of Eden God's intention in creating one man Adam was to was that he should multiply fill the earth and subdue it and bring it unto the government of God that God may be glorified in the material earth period it's from the one to the many it was the one was not an end in itself it was the beginning none of us here listening to this of listening to it not not any of us who are into ourselves were part of a multiplication which a, multi a process which is supposed to go forth I see it as a multiplication process now through this one man Abraham who could be Isaac and Jacob and 12 sons who turned into a nation which nation was put into a particular piece of geography in the center of the earth again was for the purpose of exporting this beautiful this culture of the of the land to the entire earth one man Abraham to a nation to the entire earth so you see that again as we said before in the last lesson nothing changed nothing from Adam to Abraham on now the promise of Canaan as an inheritance for the people of God was was part of the connected growing scheme that they were preparing for the people it was to have their proper outgrowing here in the final termination in establishment of Christ everlasting kingdom that's where it was going now looking at it this way the grand the, the land of Canaan needs to be regarded as the second Eden that's interesting haha <laughs> the land of Canaan is the second Eden a kind of a sacred region once more possessed by by uh, in this fallen world by God's own land of which life was going to start here it goes Life and blessings would come to all lands through this land which was restored and blessed. Like Eden. It's a type of. 
Now, it's interesting, as you do this, you receive understanding when I read books, and, and you, you look for things, they step, they step out, they, they come out at you, just, just kind of launch out at you, and you remember them. And you remember the books I've been going through, a lot of books lately. The Law of the Covenant by James B. Jordan, and this is what he writes. When God created Adam, he gave Mark to do. Adam was to dress and cultivate the garden and to keep or guard it. Yeah. Now that God has recreated Adam in Sinai, which is interesting, this writer says this simply the nation of Israel in the land of Canaan is a historical, if not a type of continuity of Adam in the Garden of Eden. Very simple. He calls Israel a recreation Adam. That's what he called it. What God intended with Adam, now he intended with Israel. And this writer daringly speaks of the nation of, as a recreation Adam. Now that God had recreated Adam at Sinai, which he did, he restored the terms of the covenant to him just exactly. They were supposed to guard themselves and their community and the land from sin. That's what they were to do. They were make it a very holy, pure nation, a place in the entire nation. They drive out the Canaanites and drive out all their gods, drive out their customs, don't be part of them, establish a geolistic culture in that land. Now, to some people, that keeps to be an arbitrary business, or kind of rough and hard. And this nation comes in and kicks another nation out. That's not fair. Well, if you read it carefully, you, God was doing two things. He was establishing his purpose and play for purpose on uh, establishing redemptively, and put Israel in that land that could be his center, and uh, kicking out the devil and customs that were demonic. Then this needed to be actualized, and he did it. Now, he also said the cup of the Amorites was full. The Canaanites had reached their saturation point of their sin. Their, their sin card had been punched out. It was, it was done. He needed to be replaced by God now, exercised from, from that property in that land. Because that land, they lost the light right to the land because of sin. There's something for you to think about. Double action. Israel took over Canaan. They put justly out as a matter of penal call, penal judgment, really, to kick out the nations which lost their right to the land by their sin, idolatry and sin. Now, he established his purpose in the land as well, and having a place for his people to, to stay and live and start. Now, he goes on, people were to guard themselves and their community from sin, and they were to move into the new garden, Eden, and cultivate it, properly, just just as the land of Canaan was a new Garden of Eden. You take care of it and get the sin out of it. Just as Adam was to start from the throne of God and cultivate the land of Eden and then out to the whole world from there, so Israel was is supposed to do that too from the throne of God in their midst, proceed out, cultivate Canaan, and hopefully spread the word of life to all the world. You see the picture? Here's what I see. It's crystal clear. What he wanted to do. And you can say it's many different things, but that's it. He wanted to cultivate that land, cultivate those people, and get that blessing out to the rest of the world. Now, it's several centuries of distress, too. And God called Abraham and started over again. And the land of Canaan became the center for which God was going to move out and call the whole world to himself. Now, we need to touch on something for a moment. Let's look at this. Now, we have here in front of me, uh, there's a beautiful drawing of the tabernacle, which I had downloaded. And what God gave in Mount Sinai was, he gave this to Moses and Israel, where the very exact plans for the building of that tabernacle Exactly. And we went over that in the last few teachings. Furnishings, his rooms, the size of the rooms, the enclosures, the various appointments of furniture, tools. He said to Moses again and again, he said to Moses, do it exactly as I tell you. 
because it's this right here, this tabernacle, is a reproduction of God's uh, throne in heaven. That's all we can say. And God Himself in the Holy of Holies, right back there. We went, we already did this, but God Himself dwelt in the Holy of Holies. That was His locality on the earth at that time. Aaron could come and talk in, come in and talk to God in the Day of Atonement with the blood when the blood was sprinkled once a year he would talk to the Lord from above the ark between the cherubim he would talk to Aaron that's his throne now going back to the Garden of Eden for just a minute let's look at this the Garden of Eden was well, let's say it this way there's the world and the land of Eden and then the land of Eden there was a Garden of Eden and in the Garden of Eden was the presence of God. Yeah. So out from the presence of God into the garden, into the land, and out into the world would, would be the same thing. And here we have the same thing. The tabernacle was the heart of a nation, the throne of God. So the throne of God first had to govern the people of Israel and then had to spread out from there so in the heart of each of these centralized situations was the very throne of God. Every time. The Garden of Eden, the throne of God, the praise of God's presence. And uh, everything was supposed to be exported. We saw that in the land of Canaan. We had the tabernacle, the throne of God, presence, the presence of God. And everything was to go out from there. So that Eden the Garden of Eden, and the land, and indeed the church, which we'll talk about later, they're not an end in themselves. They are media to change the world. That's what they're for. They're designed as a, as a center of, of God could use and his purposes could go forth. Now, if you read it, just read it. So, he brought them out of Egypt through the wilderness, and then he brought them into the land. Now, we talked about the land of Canaan as being central, as being the center by which everything is to be exploited, as with the case of the Garden of Eden. Let's look at these scriptures that confirms it somewhat. Let's, let's look at that, some descriptions of, uh, of the significance of, of, of the situations placed there in the land of Israel in terms of the earth itself. First, let's look at the scripture. Ezekiel 5.5 5. Ezekiel 5.5 5. Thus saith the Lord God, This is Jerusalem. I have set her at the center of the nations with lands around her. <laughs> now God said, I set Israel as the center, at the center of the nations. Now, why would God put them at the center of the nations? Why would he mention the nations at all? If Israel was the end to itself, what about the other nations? Matter of fact, in my opinion, if it was to be the end of itself, just pull away from the nations where it could be protected holy. The Lord puts it right in the middle of the nations, smack in the middle of nasty old nations. Now, this is our next, this is our next study. We're going to say this again. Now, this is the same thing that happens to us. We want to be protected from the nations. We want to be protected from that mess. We recluse it. Get away from them nasty people. We, we want to hide away. Find a cave and get in it. Get out of the world. And God's intention is to be right in the middle of it. And he made preparations for it. For you. All that you can do. Because you're going to get dirty. And you have to go back to the Lord and stay clean. There's things that can happen to you. Uh, let's read to you about some things in the land about the center of the earth. Now listen. In its immediate vicinity lay both the most densely public co populated country, aggressive and more influential state of antiquity it is. That's in the south was Egypt, and the north and east was Syria, and Babylon, the Medes, the Persians, Still closer with the maritime states of Tyre, Sudan, 
Well, uh, the vessels of which which visited every harbor and known to man, and its colonies were planted in three colonies of the known world. Now the great routes of inland commerce between the civilized nations of Asia and Africa lay either through a portion of the territory itself or within a short distance of its borders, true, and bounded as it was by the Mediterranean, which it was bound up, sound south by the desert, and east by the Valley of Jordan with its two seas of Tiberias and Sodom, in the north by its towering heights of Lebanon, the people who inhabited it might justly said and be said to dwell alone. They had on every side of them points of contact and conflict with the most influential of distant nations there were. The land itself, the land itself with its rich soil and plentiful resources, its varieties of hills and dales and rivers and mountains, its connections with the sea on one side, with the desert on the other side, it rendered a kind of a epitome of, of the natural world. It had everything in it. It chose it for being the home of those who would be a patterned people to the nations. It was ready. It could have sent it out from there. They were a patterned people for the nations of the earth. Now altogether, it was impossible to conceive a region more wisely selected, really, is, than in itself would be completely adopted for the purpose and account of which that Abraham will be set apart there. And if they were faithful to their covenant and their engagements that God had brought them into, right there they might exhibit it on an elevated platform before the world. They could all see it. A bright exemplary, an exemplar of a people possessed and possessing the characteristics of God and enjoying the advantages of the seed of blessings which had come from God. I think the finest opportunities were right there within the reach of proving in the highest sense all the benefactors to mankind right there extending far and wide the reach of truth and righteousness possessing the elements of the world's blessings they were placed right where these elements would be so readily for them and powerfully for the world's inhabitants now the present possession of such a region was once and for honest this whole inheritance which god gave them the world there stood real close to a step towards realization looking at Israel. There, the heir of Canaan was an heir of the world. It was considered as heirage of blessing. Now, if you look at that, I'm going into the next one I'm going to teach, which is the gospel of the kingdom. This, this went forth. When Jesus came and commissioned his men, he stopped a little fellow called Saul of Tarsus, and that commission was seen to go forth all through the land he made all kinds of journeys. And while Paul planted these churches to go out and go forth, he went out and went forth with all the apostles with him. They caught the dream, and they followed the dream, and then he would write letters to them. But let's go back to this first. And that's an interesting observation about the land. Romans 4.13 says Paul talks in Romans. Paul speaks about Abraham. God gave Abraham a piece of property in the center of the earth, in the Middle East. But when you come to the New Testament, well, everything is big and it's large to the whole world proportions. In Romans 4.13 it says, For the promise to Abraham and to his descendants that he would be the heir of the world, the cosmos, not just the land, everything. The righteousness of faith would come forth with bigness for everything. So when God established his testimony in the Garden of Eden, it was for the world. Now, when God established his testimony in the land of Israel, it was for the world. And when God gave Abraham the land of Canaan, Paul, in the New Testament again, Canaan was really a type of, of the world in the Gospel age. So that should have some uh, items to think about. That means that there is a negative sense to it, which we don't attack to too much, period. Now remember, when Israel came into the land, they were to drive out the Canaans. They were to drive out the, uh, 
the demons, the idols, the high places, all the nasty things they did, break it up, get it out. They were supposed to change the culture, period. Now, if Cain is a type of the world, and the Christian community is a type of Adam, his family, or the nation of Israel in the land, then our job, really, is to drive out every aspect of run righteousness in the earth that we come into and establish the government of God. Now, we're not talking some kind of cult here. We're talking about the the Bible. You're going to get opposition on this continuously, and I have for 40 years. From, And most of the time, it didn't come from the world. It came from Christians. We don't believe in that. We don't believe in this. We don't believe Well, the Word says that. What church do you go to? And I would tell them whatever church it was at the time. But I belong to the body of Christ, and we were to drive out devils in people's lands, devils in people's cities, devils in their constitution and what they believed and what they did was extremely liberal and wrong. It always led to death. Whenever I was called, most of the time, I was an extreme deliverer, if you want to call it that. That I would find, root out, and get down to the core of what was killing a family, what was killing people. What did they do? What did they let into the land, into their personal life? What did they do to let them in? Well, demons and Satan, they'll fool you. They're not going to come straight forward and have you be a devil worshiper. No, just don't do the word of God. Don't do what it says. Now, there are a lot of people, and I've said this before, that have a spark of divinity which brings them into a social conduct in society where they're not going to go to jail. They won't steal, they don't rob, and try to be good people. And I've always said, that'll keep you out of prison, but it won't keep you out of hell. So you'll have a fairly decent life while you're here, but you'll end up going to hell in the end anyway. And I've seen people make themselves a good life, a decent life, and they're fairly decent people, but they didn't receive Jesus because they were so good. They didn't think they needed that aspect of it, and they glazed over when you told them the good news. We're supposed to go into all the world, and that's what it shows here, we're to be a blessing to the whole world. Root out. Now, you don't hear it very often. They're supposed to take the land to be a blessing. Now, sometimes in evangelistic preaching to Sunday nights, we have the whole world by the tail, but if it just hypes you up. But if you'll look at it with, with a broad brush and stroke to show you from the beginning of how the symbol of the four rivers actually works. Great centers of world influence are supposed to be Eden, the land, and the next one's the, the kingdom, the church. And so we just see from Ezekiel 5.5, 5, the land is at the very heart, the very center of these wonderful countries in the world all around. Ocean, desert, roads, establishments. Let's, let's look at God's statement and his original intention for Israel. Let's look at that right now. Let's quote a couple of scriptures and two scriptures will suffice from this one. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you will obey the voice of the Lord God and keep his covenant, then shall you be my own possessions from among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. Now, why did the Lord say that? God said, you're my people, with a view to all people. Why did he say, why? You're my people. Not to become, to become some kind of exclusive thing, but you're my people. With a view of disseminate life, my life, and government to all people. And he goes on, you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's what you're to be. Let's, let's go one more and let's talk about prophets and priests. Exodus 34:10, And he said, Behold, I make a covenant with all thy people who do marvels, such as not what been wrought in all the earth in any nation. And all peoples among peoples thou art see will see the work of Jehovah. Now God said, I'm gonna do all kinds of wonderful things in the midst of you for for your own sake. 
I'm going to put on a show for you. Displays. Just to delight you. Make you happy. Right? No. That's not what he said. What I'm doing to you is not with just you. In mind as an end, end of things. No, it's not. But with you, you're a medium with what I'm doing. With what I'm doing to you and with you, I'm going to be doing to get the intention of the whole world. That's what I'm doing with you. That's what he said. Now, let's say something about priests and kings and prophets. And we come into the New Testament, which I'm the redeemed community. The New Testament is called the kingdom of priests. That's what we are. We're kings and priests under God. Well, that means we're supposed to reign, doesn't it? Under God. It's not like government to me. It also means that we're to be mediators. That's what we do as priests, intermediaries between the world and God. That's what we're supposed to be. What was a priest in the Old Testament? What was a priest in the Levitical Code? He was the one that rep went and represented God for the people, and represented the people for God. The Levitical order, the priesthood, it represented the, the people of Israel to God. Now, but God, the Israelites themselves were kingdom of priests. Now, who were they going to represent to God? If they, if the Aaronic priesthood, Aaron's, not a priesthood to God, what was Israel to be? They were all priests. They were bringing the nations to God. That's what they were for. Nothing else. That stops the dispensation, this, this fourth circle, which I only drew three, that we're all priests and kings to God in what way? Well, you're priests to God because you minister to the world. And that's been so hard to get through to people that you are a priest and king to God. King of kings and lord of lords, he said. And a priest, a priest to the Lord, well, the world. You represent God to the world. That's what you were supposed to. That's what Paul was saying. And people kind of touched on it, kind of didn't touch on it. But it was a very great commission of who you were, what you were in the Lord. And these things need to be looked at pretty hard, pretty heavy. Heavy. They were to get the attention of the nations and de make decorations to the nation and tell the nations what the will of God were. And power came, it was supposed to be, and let the nations what the Lord said in the Word and by the Spirit of God. They were to go together, both of them. Let's go in the New Testament real quick. Now, you don't hear much about priests in the New Testament, right? In the book of Hebrews, you do. It says in Hebrews, we don't have any more priests. We have one great high priest, and they we're all priests now. But let's listen to Paul. Yeah, listen. And uh, let's see how Paul saw himself as one of the redeemed community that he was in a prophetic capacity. Now listen to him in Romans fifteen, eighteen, and 19. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem, around about to, to Lyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Uh, Paul said this, I have been God's prophet he speaks for God, he speaks for another. A prophet is not so much a foreteller as a forth teller. Bring forth. He's making declaration of, uh, of behalf of God right now. We think of a prophet like you know, fort, fortune teller of some sort. It's going to rain next week. It's one aspect of a prophet, but a prophet who stands in God's stead. He talks for God. Remember when God called Moses to deliver Israel? And Israel, Moses said, I don't want to go, I can't talk. You know, God said, okay. Well, he got mad at Moses a little bit. He said, you can't talk, come to your brother and take him. He'll be your prophet. He'll speak for you, for me. Yep. Now, we're God's prophets. We're a prophetic community. We declare the gospel. Now, look what Paul said. In Romans fifteen sixteen. he says this, touch on priests. 
that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God so that the Gentiles, when offered before him, would be an acceptable sacrifice for him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. As a priest, he's saying, I'm going to bring the nations, have him prophesy the gospel to them, and got them obedient to the gospel, and then I'm going to bring them and offer them to you. That's my priestly offering that I offer to you. Sanctified by the Holy Spirit and made pure by the Holy Spirit. An offering to God acceptable to you. We're prophetic people. We're priestly people. Both. We must be a people that declares the word of God. And we must be a people that bring the results of that, of that priest who brings sacrifices to God. We stand between the world and God. That's what we do. That's our job. As a kingdom of priests, we bring them as offerings to God as they respond to the prophetic voice of the gospel. Amen. That's what we do. Bring them up to the Lord and show the Lord. Now, one of the mistakes that Israel made, I don't think we're being self-righteous talking about Israel's mistakes. We have our own. And we don't have much room to be critical about anybody because we all have our own. When we're talking about Israel's mistakes, we'll talk about this. One of the mistakes that they made is they considered their election and their choice as getting them the right of ownership over Jehovah. The we're it. And they became extremely possessive of, of God. Private, territorial, God belongs to me. God didn't belong to the Gentiles. They spoke pejoratively to the Gentiles and uh, they were degrading actually dogs called <laughs> dogs outside unclean dog dogs instead of bring them in they failed to realize that their election was to God was not for the purpose of isolation and own, owning and ownership but their election to God was for them to propagate God take him out to the nations we all saw that and that's one of the first things you learn but they didn't understand it they became very introverted and twisted. <laughs> it starts a whole mess. Yeah, there are some instances in the life of Israel that God's intention was always was and what it was with Israel always. Not that Israel should be a name within itself or an end within itself. That Israel should be the means by which God evangelizes the whole nations. All of them. Let's pick up that point where he first wanted to take him into land that first generation they made a lot of mistakes right there yeah he said I give you the land it's a good land it's filled with milk and honey so they called the congregational meeting they talked to Moses and said don't you think it would be wise Moses if we spend some spies into the land and uh, <laughs> to see <laughs> if the land whether it be Good or bad, Moses? Should we? Now, what did God say to them? I'm giving you a good land. He said, he did not say go check it out. He said, I'm giving you a good land. Now, you come along and say, I, I think we need to check this out. God says it's good, but let's go see. Let's go see. Let's check it out for ourselves. So they went and checked it out. With dire results to it, they saw the impossibility of the land. The giants are huge. I don't know if we could take it as <laughs> so a for instance. Here's one. Uh, I go to a meeting and say, go into the world, preach the gospel to all people, and nobody really wants to too much. Well, they, they like it, but they get excited about it. But if I tell them to sit out, take out tracks and go one-to-one -one and do your thing, we don't get a lot of yeah yeah on that. But if I suggest for a moment that God intended for the Christian community to take over the nations for Jesus Christ and offer them as a priestly sacrifice to the Lord, well, there will come a time in history when the gospel will be so successful that the prophetic voice will be so successful that the nations will walk in the light of the New Jerusalem and the nations will be discipled. And I look across the audience when I do this and see credulity. He's crazy. That's not going to happen. Look around, Baker. Yeah. Well, if I'm crazy, that Great Commission is crazy. That's what it says. 
that Israel was told to go into the land. They could take the land over. And God knew what was in the land. He didn't know what's in that land. <laughs> he didn't know about the chariots with the blades sticking out the side of the wheels to just cut you down. <laughs> Other chariots. Just run through an army and cut them off with the legs. You mean God didn't know about giant men over there with their suits of armor, huge? Did God know all about that? Yeah, he did. God said it's a good land. It's filled with milk and honey. It's well able to take it. Go on. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. It's yours. Go get it. Well, we'll go spy it out, Moses. Yeah? Let's go see. <laughs> it's it's hard to resist to draw the parallels to it. It just, it just is there. Yeah. We say, can we make disciples of all nations? And let me go check the nations lately, have you? Have you seen them? Have you seen the giants of the nations? They're huge politically. They're huge mess with. They're changing the school system. They're making it against the law to preach the gospel anywhere to talk about Jesus. We have perverted people. It's a Sodom and Gomorrah. And they're passing laws to make it Sodom and Gomorrah. Have you seen the nations, Lord? Do you see this before me? I don't know if we could do this. Well, yeah, yeah. God said, make disciples of the nations. That's faith talk, huh? Now, we go out and look at the nations and look at the resources that are available. Uh, yeah, look at, that's like looking at the disciples of the little boy's lunch and saying, what do we have here? We have 5,000 men, women and children, 15,000 people overall. Look at the lunch. What do we have here? <laughs> we have got much. And Jesus said, well, there's not much. There's not much, God. And God said, give it to me. And we look at the smallness of the redeemed community that we have over there. And he said, go and disciple the nations. We go, well, how can we do that with a little lunch, Lord? You're not going to do it with a little lunch. I'm going to do it with a little lunch. When they turned the little lunch to Jesus, he took the little lunch and he blessed it and he multiplied it and he broke it over and over again. It fed about 15,000 people. He didn't say to the disciples, look at that little lunch and Look at that crowd. Look at that little lunch in that crowd. Say you can't do it. He knew exactly what Philip was going to do. He turned to Philip. And he said to Philip, How much would it take to give these people something to eat? And Philip looked at him and he said, Math, do a little math, and 20, and 15,000, this, and everything. He got it all figured out and said, Well, it's, it'll take so many dollars worth of bread and, and everybody would have just a little to eat. And what was Philip doing? God said, the Lord said, we need not go home. They need to be fed. And Philip said immediately, even if we had all this money, it's only going to give them a little bit. And what did Philip do? Philip began to handle the problem in the natural only human resources. That's all there was for him. Now you and I do that all the time. And if we do that all the time, we get defeated before we ever get started. Done. And a lot of people do that. So they went and checked out the land, the 12 spies. 10 came back and said, you can't do it. You should see those giants. They're massive. The thickness of the walls of those cities was so huge. And if you saw one of those chariots, oh, you would forget it forever. Don't go in there. You can't do it. Two of them said, we could do it. Caleb and Joshua said, they could do it. We can do it. We can do it. Let's go. We can do it. But the people murmured. Those ten, these twelve spies, let's remember that, they weren't ordinary people. They were twelve princes. They were top men. They had influence with the people. And the people looked to them for influence and government help. And when ten of them out there told the crowds, we can't do it, that was the majority. The people grumbled and complained if they wouldn't go in. Now there's something that we don't read there too often, but we need to. And the Bible categorically said these. The ten spies got a plague and died. God killed them, basically. In a plague. It says they got sick, got a plague. Some killed them. And with that carried with it some really heavy, serious implications with it. 
And if I question the ability of God's redeemed community to disciple the nations, question it over and over again, it could mean death or premature death or not doing good. Are we talking about death of a ministry? Death of a vision? Death of a person? I don't know. But once you read all those things, you say, okay, well, we'll translate that over the New Testament. Don't play with it. The giants, the walled cities, the knives on the wheels, they wouldn't go in. They turned back. And God got angry. He had a dialogue with Moses. He said, Moses, I delivered those people out of Egypt on eagle's wings. I did miracles in the court of Pharaoh. I gave manna every morning. I, uh, sky angels flew out in the desert every morning. Water out of the flitty rock. I was a military expert. I protected them on the road. I, I led them by a cloud. <laughs> oasis to oasis. I brought them now to the point of going into their inheritance. I gave them a constitution. Something to do. I've done everything I could to equip them and get them ready. And they still turn back. Moses, I'm going to wipe them all out. Moses, I'm just going to get rid of them and I'll start with you. We'll make a great nation out of your loins. A whole new people. Start again. And Moses takes on his type of an intercessor, type of Christ. He said, A prophet like an amnesia of the Lord raise up, and him you shall hear, and those who didn't be cut off. So he interceded. And he said, oh, No, no, no. That's what Jesus does for us too. Don't do that, Moses said. Don't do that, God. Don't do that. It's, 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 it's put in the manner of a man talking to man. And Moses and God are talking, and Moses said, I'm going to wipe them out. Moses said, don't do that. You can't do that. You'll lose your reputation. The old Egyptians say you couldn't do it. You can't do that. Don't do that. You'll, you'll look bad. Take them in and forgive them, and, and let's go on. And Moses, God said, Moses, I'll forgive them. But uh, remember, this generation's not going in. They'll wander in the wilderness till they all die off, and I'll take the next generation. I'll take the children. Period. They use the children as an excuse to not go in, and I'm going to use them to go in. Well, we can't go in because of our children. They can't go in. They were cowards, not the kids. But they used the old kids as a shield for not going in. That's a whole lot of other things. We have a problem in the New Testament about using our kids not to do, do what we're going to do. I've got to take care of them. No, you go do what you're told to do. So he'll take the children and he'll go in. Huh? And then he paused. And he said something was... It's interesting. He said, Moses, I want you to know something, Moses. I'm very disappointed in this generation. I'm going to have to kill them off in the wilderness and wait for another generation to come. But listen to me, Moses. As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with my glory. All of it. Hallelujah. What was he saying, Moses? Moses, this generation has failed me. Another generation may fail. I don't know how many generations will fail. But as truly as I live, I'll bet this on my character, as truly as I live, there is a day coming when the whole earth will be filled and filled with my glory. <laughs> now he said that to Moses. My intention is the whole earth, Moses. It's not just this land. It's the whole earth. It's not just the church. It's the earth. The Lord is after the nations. We think he's after the Presbyterians or the Baptists or the Pentecostals or the Catholics. He's not after that. He's after the nations. He wants the nations. All the little religious ditties out there is impediment to what he's calling us to do. I think the earth needs to have a massive education of Christian people. First, to understand God's world purpose and intention. That's why they're it's, I, I call this God's world purpose and intentions. And I'm not the only one. There are many ministers and teachers who've taught the same thing. But you have to take on this information so it's not restrictive, not confining. You're not church to be stuck. But there's too many in, in my travels that are small thought and they're thinking about their little congregation and what they're doing. 
is God bless me and my wife, John and me and this forward not more. It's the, the reductionists, they constrict the gospel down to, to nothing, me, me, me. They use their faith for healing, they use their faith for money, they use their faith for things, but you should use your faith for the nations, the nations, the world to be filled with the glory of God. He told Moses that. Jesus said that. There are many who said that. I, I've heard prophecies and prophecies of people who have said, God is after the nations, the nations. And to a great degree, there have been many in my lifetime that have gone to the nations. Reinhard Bunke, millions have come to Jesus at his, under his ministry. He's dead and gone now. But there were many, many, many who went around the world with the anointed God. They did the, they did the, the commission that God told them to do. And they headed out and did it. They had a big faith. Be strong. And we needed a community that helped them and would bring that government of God underneath the people, get them ready for Christ to come, that he'd receive something to hand to the Father as a priest. The nations, just that you're supposed to as a priest, lead people to Christ, offer it up to the Father as an offering. Here's the fruit. Now, Jesus is, is to say, This is the best I could do. This is the fruit of my cross. It's just a few. No, the word says he's going to retain, be retained in heaven till. The restoration of all things spoke to us by, by the prophets. Now, he said, sit down. He's told Jesus in heaven, sit down here. Stay here until your enemies are footstool by the preaching of the gospel. Yeah, yeah, the gospel. And when your enemies are all brought under your feet, death. Then you'll receive your kingdom right there. And death will be swallowed up. That's a great vision. Paul, Jesus. Peter, James, they all spoke it. Now, at Kadesh, God declared his intention to, for all of them. Let's see, going across the Red Sea. Oh, let's go at the deliverance out of Egypt. Boy, I can imagine that. Ooh, hoo, hoo. He got up to that sea and said, if we, you bring us out here just to drown us? We can't fight. He's good to us Israelites. Yeah. He does look after us. And I'm not making light of him. Uh, or imbalanced about it. He does look after us. He loves us. He takes care of us. And he elected us and saved me. He elected me and saved me. You too. But he didn't save me as an end to myself. He saved me that I might become a conduit by which and by through he could reach out to others. My life has been saved to be that conduit. Forty years I have sought to and I did so often to speak about him, to witness to him, to show people him, what he did, what he does. And that's the nature of salvation, such grace go forth. But then there's some some uh, harshness in it too. you got to do both. And then they get screwed up and stagnant, people would be. I watched it. They become stagnant. You're not to be stagnant, you're flowing water, not stagnant. If you become stagnant, you get that's nasty. Some mosquitoes and mess, you get the stagnant water, diseases. It's supposed to be fresh water, flowing. It's not stagnant. That's the gospel. Let's look at the Red Sea real quick. The prophet of the prophet crossed in the Jordan. Why did he do those? Why did he show those? Now, that's a tight spot he got into there with millions of people. The Red Sea with the Egyptians coming at you with an army. They're in a tight spot. And they crossed in the Jordan. They had to get in the land. And God wrought a miracle there as well. But it's just to get them through, or what was it for? Now he says this, in Joshua 4.24 said this, These things were done, now listen, that all the people of the earth may know the hand of Jehovah that is mighty, that he may fear Jehovah the God forever. Well, I just thought he took Israel for the Red Sea to save them. Yeah, no, 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 no. He did that, but he did it so the world would know. Yeah. Let me tell you how he saved me. It's wonderful things. And no, and I've heard that from people, and I said, was that the end of the story of your salvation? Is that your witness? Did he save you so somebody else could see it? They see the strength of God's hand? Now let's multiply that. There's 50 or 60 million Christians in the United States. They weren't just saved to go to heaven, but they were saved to become the medium 
of the demonstration of God's power to this earth, his delivered hand, his strength. I, I don't think I could go to China and do it, but, but Chinese Christian can, and Indian Christian can, and Czechoslovakian Christian can, and you and I in our realm, wherever we were put, we can be that medium where you're put. Now if that's multiplied all over the earth. Well, it becomes a possibility at that point. It becomes an intellectual possibility, for sure. For the glory of God to be witnessed everywhere. So the Red Sea, the crossing of the Jordan, they weren't just designed to deliver God's people. They were designed to demonstrate of God's his exhibition of Jehovah's power for the whole world to see his power. Let's go to David and Goliath. Let's know the event real well. We've seen it. We know it. We read it. We read it from Sunday school and everybody uses it. The little guy beat up the big guy. It sure does appeal to you, doesn't it? Little David coming out there just not being able to wear the king's armor and took a slingshot and pops him right in the head. First time you ever heard that in Sunday school, you were inspired for life by that. Oh, I can do it. What was that all about? Well, that was to save Israel from the scandal of being dominated by the Philistines. Well, yeah, but part of it, but that's not all of it. First Samuel seventeen forty-five to 47 says this, And David said to the Philistines, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, and I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. You taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands and I will strike you down and remove your head from you and I will give the dead body of the, of the army of the Philistines the birds of the sky the wild beasts of the earth are you listening? Listen, listen to this that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel oh ho oh, oh. God was put on that demonstration for the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah, he was. <laughs> Though he would just do that to deliver Israel. Yes, he was doing that to deliver Israel. But not to just deliver Israel. That's where get saved and go to heaven comes in. What's salvation for? Get me saved and go to heaven. No, it's to get you saved, get you ready to influence the world. Take somebody else with you as priests to offer up to God. You missed a step there. You missed a step, go to save, go to heaven. No, uh, you know, you know go into the world, get them saved, show them to Jesus, and then get saved, go on to heaven. Let's go to Solomon now. And his vision. This is First Kings chapter 8, uh, 41 through 43, 59, and 60. This is Solomon's, his dedication prayer. Let's go. Also concerning the foreigner who is not of thy people Israel, when he comes from a far country with thy namesake, for listen now, for they will hear of your great name and thy mighty hand and thy outstretched arm. Why is the foreigner coming? Why is he coming, the foreigner? You saw that. We talk about the Queen of Sheba too. Why did she come? Somebody told her what was going on in Israel. Yeah. They got a God in Israel that works all the time. Stretched out arm. Our gods let us down. We got a lot of them just for that very reason. And we turn to another God when they let us down. When we have all kinds of gods and thought it did much good. They got a God who does works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They sow the grapes like pumpkins. <laughs> Great. They have the finest breed of cattle and grains, the best grains in the world. The stories that come out of that place are fantastic. And they attribute it to that God of theirs, who is God Yahweh. That's who they attribute it to. Uh, that's what he said. They hear thy great name and thy mighty hand, and thy outstretched arm when he comes and prays towards his house. Hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and do according to all which the foreigner calls to thee, in order that all the people of the earth may know thy name and to fear thee. Wow, wow, we, wow, we. That's different yeah, to what the Israelites exuded, isn't it? Gentile with a dirty dog, 
Israel. God is ours. He's exclusively ours. He's an Israelite. Yeah. Yeah, God's ours. That's not what that's not what Solomon said. Solomon said that's not the point. The reason he's our God is he wants to become their God. Yeah, yeah. He's not our God. He's not our only. We're supposed to share him. And, and he does this with an outstretched arm. He shows his great miracles to show people. That's the signs of wonders concerning his word. Let's go on with the prayer. Let's see. In order that all the peoples of the earth might know thy name and to fear thee, as do thy people Israel, that they may know that his house which I built is called by thy name. And may these words of mine, which I made supplication before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel. From each day requires, yep, here it is again, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord our God is one God and there's no one like him. There's no one like him. Are you hearing this? I'm not too good at it, but you see where historically God uh, messed up? He's my God. He's mine, mine, mine. And they call everybody else dirty and think of you as second class. Uh-uh. No. No. And that's what the devil wants people to think anyway. No. He gets involved in everything. No. He's he's God, the world. He wants the world. He wants the world. He does want to be yours, to want to be theirs. And he's ours to be theirs. And this has been messed with and cursed from the very beginning. It was a curse in Israel, that's for sure. It's been the curse in the church. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it. It's a curse with our imbalanced emphasis on on uh, well it left an impression that God's for us but he's not for you he's against you he's against them <laughs> whatever that is God is not against anybody God's for God was in Christ reconciled the world unto himself God is for us that we might be for them that might be for him yeah that's the sequence of it how it's supposed to roll now I love this one. Let's go. This is Sheba. 1 Kings 10, 1 through 10, 23 and 24. And when the Queen of Sheba heard about the famous Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she claimed to test him with these questions. Well, she came to Jerusalem with a very large revenue, with camels carrying spices and gold and precious stones. When she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. And Solomon answered her all her questions, every one of them. Nothing was hidden from the king, which he did not explain to her. When the queen of Sheba perceived all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seaman of his servants, the attendants of his waiters and their attire, his cupbearers, his stairway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your word and your wisdoms. Nevertheless, I didn't believe your reports till I came my eyes seen them. And behold, the half was not told me. Your exceeding wisdom and prosperity, which I heard, you're better than what I heard. How blessed are you, men. How blessed are you. How blessed righteousness and joy how blessed are your men how blessed are these your servants who stand before you continually and hear your wisdom how blessed they are blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you to set you on such a throne of Israel because the Lord loveth Israel and he therefore he made you king to do justice and righteousness and she gave the king a hundred and twenty talents of gold and great, a great amount of spices and stones. Never again did such abundance of spices come in that the queen of Sheba gave Solomon. So King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. Now listen. Now listen. And all the earth was seeking the presence of Solomon 
to hear the wisdom which God had put in his mouth. Now in Solomon's day, the kingdom was at its best. It really was. That's when the kingdom reached its apex then. Solomon messed it up. He blew it. But it was at its apex. That was the point where Solomon was a type of Christ in the ultimate dimension of the gospel that we see. Now in the New Testament, Matthew twelve forty two, we read this. Jesus said this, The Queen of the South, Yeshiva, the Queen of the South shall rise up with this generation at the judgment and shall condemn it because she came to all the ends of the earth as the King James says from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold something greater than Solomon's here ooh 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 uttermost parts of the earth where do we hear that in Acts 1 8 and you shall be witnesses unto me into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Where did this Queen of Sheba come from? from? Queen of Sheba came from the uttermost parts of the earth. So back in Solomon's day, the uttermost parts of the earth did hear about the fame of Jehovah in the land, and they came to Solomon to see it, a gripe of Christ. The type of the kingdom of God in its final glory is when uttermost parts of the earth we're, we're coming up there yeah the earth shall be covered with the glory of God as the water covers the sea praise God let's close this out now let's see here 67th Psalm uh, consideration of it the 67th Psalm all I'm showing you tonight was the Garden of Eden with the world in view the land of Canaan with where the world was in view now, Israel didn't understand that all the time, but we see it. And they wanted to exclude it. Israel wanted to confine its mission to them. They wanted to reduce it to them. My, 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 me, me, me. But in God's mind, it was the world. He has the world in his eye. <clears throat> now, Psalm 67 says this. Some principles real quick. God, be gracious to us. In my Bible, it's this circle us. Be gracious to us, God. No question about that. We're the redeemed people. We're his people. Us. Bob, be gracious to us. And bless us. And cause his face to shine upon us. Full stop in a psalm. No? No. But I'd be justified in saying full stop in a psalm. For a lot of people, you need to go on. Now, a lot of people do. Full stop. How many churches do I go to that be with this Lord, believe with this Lord, cause your face to shine this Lord? Oh, it's just us, 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 Lord. It's in churches everywhere. Full stop. The Fomus doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. Next verse. God be gracious to us and bless us. And cause his face to shine upon us. That, that is the word. That leads on to the next part. That, that, that. That. That thy ways may be known. Where at? On the earth. That thy way be known on the earth. <laughs> Bless us that we can pass it on. Bless us that we can pass it on. It's not meant for me to store up. And hide up, stoke up in a cave someplace and hide. Let it know, shine out. Let your light shine to the world. We've heard that before. What does that mean? You have to do it first. Let God bless you to all nations. God is a world person. God is a world person. I'm going to stop right there. Finish that verse up and you can see her go into the next verse. And you can see what he meant, but I want to finish this up now. Father, we ask you to bless those who receive this teaching and ask you that they go out into the world and spend it on people and bring it back to the Lord. Show the Lord your offering as a priest that you led people to Christ. Show them the gifts. 
Use the power, Father God, in your word by your spirit. Healing, blessing, loving, as we pray for those and lead those to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Now, this is Mike. If you enjoyed it, go to the next one. We'll see you. Jesus is Lord.